All right. So let's start by talking about how monopolists choose their price and choose their output. So since they have no competitors, monopolists don't have any concern about what their competition is doing. So there's no thinking about what kind of products are firms offering, do I need to innovate, um, what price should I sell it at, what quantity should I try to make. Um, they don't have to think about other firms that are making these decisions. They only have to think about themselves. So just like in perfect competition or in monopolistic competition, which we'll talk about later, they try to maximize their profit by choosing what quantity to produce. Now in perfect competition, the market there was a downward sloping demand curve, but for each individual firm, they faced a horizontal demand curve. Now for monopolists, their demand curve is the market demand curve. So they're gonna have a downward sloping demand curve. And what we're gonna end up seeing is that because there's barriers to entry that exist, there's something that prevents other firms from being able to enter and compete in the market, economic profits are gonna last for monopolists in the long run. So in perfect competition, firms would have their economic profit competed away by new firms entering the industry. In this case, we won't have firms being able to enter the industry. So any economic profit that exists in the short run is going to last in the long run for monopolists as well. So let's start out with everyone's favorite monopolist, Comcast. We'll walk through an example for them. As you know, when I moved down to DC, I was so pumped to finally have an option because there's like two or three cable providers down there to finally not have to have Comcast. And somehow Comcast was the highest rated one down there. So I was stuck with them again. So here we have all the stuff we need for an monopolist to figure out the revenue and so we can draw these cost curves. Now something that's different from perfect competition you see, as we increase the number of subscribers, the number of consumers that are willing to purchase a product, we see the price going down. That's our downward sloping demand curve. So as we decrease the price from $60 to $57, we have an additional subscriber who wants the price. At that point, the price is now worth it for them to purchase that good. So we'll see, as we increase or decrease the price and increase the number of people willing to purchase these goods, we end up with the total revenue increase. But notice it increases by less and less each time. That's what we see here with the average revenue and the marginal revenue. So both of these decreasing over time as we're cutting the price. So if you're a monopolist, you have to think, or you have to weigh um, the lower revenue you get per unit when you decrease the price versus the additional consumers which are willing to purchase your goods. Yeah, so if we look at, take an example here, um, going from six units to seven units, if they decrease the price from 42 to $39, they get the $39 from that additional consumer being willing to purchase but they also lose $3 per unit for the previous six units that they would have sold anyway at the higher price. So while you're increasing revenue by what, $39, you're also losing $18 on those previous units. And that's why we end up with the marginal revenue of $21 for the seventh unit. So here we have a graph that shows marginal revenue and demand for a monopolist. So we see the demand curve, which equals, is the same as the average revenue curve up here. Then our marginal revenue, which is much lower. So like I said, you have the revenue increasing from selling an additional unit, but you also have revenue decreasing because of the price reduction that the existing customers who would have purchased a higher price anyway, they're now paying less 
each of them. So you're seeing revenue fall as well. And that's why, despite the increase in sales, our marginal revenue curve is going to be below the demand curve. So perfect competition, marginal revenue curve, and demand curve were both horizontal, and they were the same at the, at the price. Here we see they're different. We have demand curve <coughs> above the marginal revenue curve. So here we have the same sort of graph that we had for the perfectly competitive firm, although with the slight differences for the monopolists being different. So just like before, our margin or marginal cost curve is going to be like that Nike swoosh. That's going to be the additional cost of producing another unit of the good. And just like in perfect competition, our monopolist is going to produce the quantity where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. So right here at point A, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost is where they're going to produce. So in this case, it's going to be six units. But the price they're going to sell it at is where that six units crosses the demand curve. So the profit maximizing price for, monopol for a monopolist is going to be higher than where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. So in this case, that's only $27 here at point A. So you know, in an efficient market where there's competitors, that's where they would be pricing. Instead, they're pricing up here where it crosses the demand curve. So it's a much higher price. Is that also a graph for um, monopolist maximizing profit or is that graph? Yeah, it is. It is? Yeah. yeah, so at where that marginal revenue equals marginal cost, that's where they're gonna have the greatest amount of profit. Yeah, so here we have the next slide shows actually calculating the profit when you have the average total cost curve. And just like for uh, perfect competition, it's going to be the difference between the price the goods being sold at and the average total cost for that unit. So again, we're producing at the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. In this case, it's six here. Trace that up to the demand curve at that six units, and that's going to be the price that the monopolist is going to be charging. And then to calculate the profit, you get take the difference between the price and the average total cost at that point, multiplied by the quantity. So the only real difference here between a monopoly and between uh, perfect competition is that while marginal revenue equal marginal cost determines the quantity that we're producing at for both, the price is going to be above that. So in a monopolistic market, we end, um, monopolists end up charging a higher price than they would in a market with competition. That's the big takeaway there. And because there's um, barriers to entry, even though we have this nice big piece of economic profit here that these monopolists are able to earn, we're not going to see that competed away by new entrants. Again, because of these barriers to entry that are preventing them from getting in. So basically, there's going to be no distinction between the short run and the long run for a monopoly. For perfect competition, we, were, we split it up into the short run and the long run. And in the long run, we saw more competitors entering the market. Will not be the case here. So again, that's why this economic profit is going to be persisting in the long run. Now, because firms are able to capture this economic profit, and maintain it in the long run, um, instead of having it competed away, um, firms are going to want to have a monopoly to somehow establish its market power. Later on, we'll talk about how sometimes they do that through differentiating their product, and that's how we end up with this monopolistic competition. 
But in a pure monopoly, there's some sort of other barrier that's presenting or preventing other firms from getting in. Um, because of this chance for economic profit to last for so long, firms are willing to even lobby the government for some sort of protection to prevent competition from being able to enter. Um, there's a pretty cool paper from Matt Mitchell that came out, I think a year ago, a year or two ago, um, looking at the attitudes of different businesses. And of course, businesses support free markets for every single industry but theirs. Literally the questions they were asked about how important markets are, how important competition is to ensure like the best products are being created. It always said how important it was. And then once the questions turned to their specific industry, there was something different in their industry every time that created this need to make sure there were these regulations that just happened to be barriers to entry to protect their market share. So let's do a quick thought experiment, work through a comparison between monopoly and perfect competition so we can see what the effect on economic efficiency would be. So let's think to ourselves, imagine a market for smartphones is perfectly competitive. We've got a ton of firms offering all these different types of phones. Um, all the smartphones are pretty much the same, but there is a ton of them and there's a ton of different firms, so no firm has any sort of market power in this market. Then one firm buys up all the smartphones in the country. So what do you guys think would happen to the price of smartphones? If one company owned it all? Yeah. It would go up? Yeah, price is going to increase, naturally. How about the quantity of smartphones? <clears throat> yeah, it will go down. How about the net benefit to consumers, the consumer surplus? You see that going up, going down, staying the same? Yeah. Someone say down? Yeah. That's right. But how about the net benefit or the um, producer surplus? That's going to go up. These firms are going to be better off. Yeah. And how about all of society? So economic surplus, the total. Think it'll go down? You're right. So, here we have, we can compare monopolist to, to a, um, a market with more competition. So we have our marginal revenue curve here and our demand curve here. Now, if we were producing, when marginal cost curve crosses the demand curve instead, right here would be our price with competition and our equilibrium quantity with competition. Compare that to the monopolist who chooses level of production where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and then prices above that where it crosses the demand curve, you see a lower quantity being sold when there's this monopoly power. And there's fewer transactions being engaged in because of the higher price that's being charged. And again, you see the price increase when there's market power, when we have these monopolists. So, originally, consumer surplus is above this, or I guess if there's competition, consumer surplus is above here, so it's A, B, and this triangle up here. Where is the producer surplus, this area right here, and C? When there's competition. When there's no competition, Monday, October 26th, when we have a monopolist, the rectangle A now is transferred from consumer surplus to the monopolist. So the monopolist is making themselves better off at the expense of consumers. We also see B, the dead weight loss that consumers lose because of these transactions that are no longer taking place. So at this lower price, at this greater quantity, when there's competition, all these consumers are made better off from engaging in these transactions. When we, uh, in this case, one smartphone producer buys up all the other companies and they're the only smartphone manufacturer, we now see fewer transactions taking place. So these consumers are made worse off. And consume, or the producers are made a little bit worse off by losing the rectangle C, or triangle C, from the sales they're no longer making. Now while they're being made slightly worse off by losing C, 
the gains they get from that rectangle of A is going to be much larger. So they make themselves better off. Consumers are made worse off. Overall, the economy is made worse off because we have this dead weight loss that we're experiencing. Um, yeah, and the price increases and the quality being traded falls. This is why monopolies are considered so bad, considered so inefficient, and why you just have uh, uh, general attitudes towards monopolies being negative. And that's not even getting involved with terrible customer service that most monopolists offer. Again, because there's no competition. So there's much less pressure to actually do a good job. So how large are these efficiency losses that we get from monopolists? So there are very few monopolies, very few actual monopolies in the world today, or at least in the United States. So the loss of economic efficiency is going to be relatively small, just because there's so much competition in general in most industries. But a lot of firms do have some sort of market power. So in perfectly competitive markets, we have the firms as price takers, where the, the price is determined by the market, and they have no ability to increase the prices they're selling the goods at. In most markets, firms do have some sort of market power. They have the choice of where they want to price the good or service they're offering. And they'll do that at a price that's greater than marginal cost. We saw this for monopolists. And when we get into monopolistic competition later, we'll see the same sort of thing happening. And perfect competition, again, is an extremely rare type of market. So most firms, most industries, there's some sort of market power out there. So there's some efficiency losses. But overall, economists estimate that the loss of efficiency due to market power in the U.S. is probably less than 1% of our total production. So while there is a decent amount of market power out there, we're not losing too much money because of it. That's about $500 per person per year, <clears throat> which is annoying but not, not terrible. And while most firms have market power, they still do face a relatively decent amount of competition. So they're gonna end up charging prices that are pretty close to marginal cost. And it's gonna be a lot better than what we see from monopolists. They charge a much higher price than marginal cost. So due to monopolies and market power in general, the dead weight losses aren't too large. They still exist, but they're relatively small. So while market power may reduce the amount of economic efficiency and may reduce consumer surplus and cause some deadweight loss because we're pricing these goods higher than marginal revenue. There are some good things about market power. So the first is just the chance to be able to get some market power, be able to differentiate, differentiate your products somehow, <clears throat> drives firms to innovate. So they create new products and new services. And they also create um, and try to develop some sort of brand reputation, another source of market power. Um, so what we get is these new products being created. We get things that better meet consumer needs because of the chance of obtaining some market power. Now, if there's no barriers to entry, then this can be really good for the economy because instead of just you know pricing this as low as possible, we're getting this true competition, these new products that meet consumer needs better than they did in the past. It's when there is those barriers to entry that exist that this market power becomes a problem. So we have small firms, these new entrants, these entrepreneurs that hope making profits in the future. And we see large firms reinvest their profits they're making currently to try to make even more um, that are encouraged by this chance of obtaining market power and getting some economic profit. Uh, it was uh, Joseph Schumpeter who talked about the drive to create market power for themselves to cause creative destruction, what he termed um, new industries being created, new products being created that destroy the old ones. 
and what he said about creative destruction and why it was so important that even though consumers are going to pay a slightly higher price for these goods and services, um, because of this differentiation and the drive to create these new products, what we end up with is consumers benefiting more in the long run. Because rather than getting the goods as cheap as possible, they're getting new types of goods that actually meet their needs or meet their needs better. And that's part of the reason why we have the government not care so much about firms with market power. While they care about true monopolists, especially when they act anti-competitively, do something to harm other firms in the industry, we don't seem to care, we don't have government act too much to um, just stop firms from obtaining market power. So let's turn to how the government responds to monopolists when monopolists exist. So because they reduce consumer surplus and economic efficiency, so they harm not just the economy overall, but consumers specifically, governments try to regulate their behavior. So they try to um, Sometimes they actually control their pricing, so they have limits to how much monopolists are able to charge in their prices when there's no way to compete against them. Uh, one example of that was railroad in like the 1800, late 1800s. They would actually set price caps on different railroads because there was only typically just one railroad that you could take between the like, two cities. So if you want to travel to that place, you're basically stuck with um, going through that railroad company. And they do other things to prevent um, monopolies from forming. So they'll stop firms from colluding together. Um, they'll prevent firms from um, merging, from acquiring competitors so that they become a monopolist or become large enough that they may uh, become a monopolist in the future. Um, and through that, they use antitrust laws. So when businesses collude, they basically reach an agreement to charge the same price or to otherwise not compete against each other. Basically, they agree to price goods um, or services artificially high, higher than marginal revenue, higher than the market, and equilibrium would dictate. Um, and they agree not to lower prices against each other, not to offer deals against each other, um, to try to attract more consumers to them. Collusion is very difficult to keep in the real world because every single firm that's involved in colluding could make themselves much better off by charging a lower price, by going back on that deal and selling at a lower price and capturing all those other consumers. So in practice, it's very difficult, but it doesn't stop firms from trying and it obviously can make consumers worse off. So as a result, for 150 years or so, we've had antitrust laws in the United States. And these laws prevent collusion. They try to eliminate it through a bunch of penalties and through official legal proceedings. Um, and try to promote competition between firms within industries. All right, so here's a few of the important antitrust laws over the years. Um, in the 1870s and 1880s, we had Companies grow large, really for the first time in the United States, seeing firms grow to be, uh, to have really big market power in an industry or even become a monopolist in their industry. So there's all these large companies putting out or purchasing smaller companies. And it really is the first time we experienced this. And we also, also saw these boards of trustees overseeing several firms within the same industry. So basically creating monopoly because they coordinated between each other as if they were just one firm. So the federal government responded with a bunch of antitrust laws over the years. So the first one is Sherman. This was um, 1890. So it prohibited uh, price fixing and prohibited collusion and then outlawed monopolization. And they followed that up in 1914 with the Clayton Act. So firms couldn't buy stocks of competitors 
and they prevented those board of directors from serving multiple companies and operating them as if they were one company. Um, when the government goes after monopolists today, they use Sherman and Clayton um, as a mechanism to do so. 1914 also saw the, the Federal Trade Commission Act, which established the FTC, and they helped administer the antitrust laws. <clears throat> Um, Federal Trade Commission also, still to this day, operates to um, en enhance and promote competition within industries. And it's not just for products, we also do a lot for services. Um, best example we can think of is the Fairness Contact Lens Consumer Act, which um, the FTC is the one who um, I don't know, enforces that law. Basically, in the past, up until like 2004 when the law was passed, if you wanted to get your eyes examined and purchase contacts from someone else, the optometrist could tell you no, say, I'm not going to give you your prescription. Now you're, they're required to give you your prescription, and you can go purchase contacts anywhere. So, um, it's not just what we typically think of monopolists as someone um, selling goods, but they also, the FTC also encourages competition. Um, within services as well. Uh, the last two are a little bit, little bit less important. <clears throat> um, so the first two, Sherman and Clayton, those acts were left intentionally vague, and they were done so so that the government would have a lot of leeway to go after whatever companies they saw as having too much market power, give them the sort of flexibility to respond as they thought was necessary. Another reason they left it intentionally vague is economists knew very little about monopolies and how monopolies operated back in 1890. So there were no experts that really understood monopolies because they were pretty, in most cases, they were pretty new. This wasn't something, these trusts weren't something that we dealt with in America before. So it was a long, um, it took a while to begin to understand this. So there were some political motives behind the creation of antitrust. So the state of Missouri had an antitrust act that they passed in 1889, so a year before Sherman. Basically what happened is small farms were complaining about these much larger farms that could sell these goods at lower prices because they had some economies of scale. And thanks to railroads becoming widespread in the 1880s, these small farms in Missouri were now facing competition for firms outside of the state. So again, they didn't like that. So what they did is they lobbied the state legislature for laws that helped protect them. So they used the Missouri Antitrust Act to go after these larger farms from outside the area. So basically we had the creation of antitrust legislation being used to prevent competition instead of being used to help competition. And that's a problem with some of these, a lot of times when we use these antitrust acts in um, practice. So despite the fact that these trusts were forming and they were, um, they were colluding together, act as if they were one firm to have this monopoly power. Interestingly, what we saw is during the 1880s and 90s, these trusts were offering lower and lower prices on their products instead of higher prices. So instead of these trusts forming and offering, or you know, reducing consumer surplus by restricting the output, increasing the price, what they end up doing is decreasing the price. They actually make consumers better off by offering these lower prices. Basically, at the time, we were just discovering economies of scale. When you have, excuse me, poor transportation, or very expensive transportation, or untrustworthy um, transportation, it's very difficult to form large companies and to ship goods um, you know, far from where they're being created. As we, as we go through the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, Railroads become much more efficient, they become much cheaper. Um, shipping to other countries becomes much cheaper. Um, we have these firms able to take advantage of economies of scale for the first time. And when the firm becomes large enough, they start um, you know, have those decreasing average total costs as they, have these, as they grow larger, develop these economies of scale. 
but we see that they're actually able to transport goods outside the area. So they have much, much larger markets. So that's why we saw these prices falling and this market power forming for the first time in the US. Another thing that they went after is predatory pricing about these um, one firm trying to gain market power by offering the price too low so that other firms are forced to like lower their prices to compete with them, but then it ends up being lower than their costs and they get put out of business. Once they go bankrupt, then that firm has market power and they can jack the prices up. But the problem is it's very often seen in the real world, even though it's accused of happening quite a bit. And the problem is you have to make sure your competition knows that you're engaging in predatory pricing or it's not going to work. But if, it, if you clearly broadcast to your competitors that you're going to lose money in the short run, you're going to be willing to do that in order to put them out of business, it's going to kill your stock price as people see your, your profits falling or going negative. Well, it makes it very difficult to actually do in practice. And even if you force out all the competition and then jack the prices up, that's not going to last very long unless there's some sort of barrier to entry preventing them from getting in. So what you're going to do is lose all this money to capture some profits in the short run, and then those profits are going to be competed away. So predatory pricing in most cases doesn't even make sense for these firms. And one of the reasons is the physical human capital isn't destroyed. So the workers, even though these firms go out of business, they're still skilled. They still know what they're doing for these firms, or for whatever industry they're in. And obviously the physical capital, the stuff you use for manufacturing, isn't destroyed. So any entrepreneur can buy those assets cheap and end up competing again. We saw this in the 1930s when the Washington Post went bankrupt. What happened is someone came in and bought it super cheap and started running the newspaper again. Because there are all these journalists that are really good at writing. They had all the stuff to print the newspapers. They had everything they needed to go. So you still had that company existing, even though they were forced to go bankrupt in the short run. So who actually brings these antitrust lawsuits? So for each one brought by the government, whether they use Sherman or Clayton, uh, there's 20 that are being brought by other firms, or typically competitors. So sometimes you end up with um, what's called vertical partners being involved. So it's either mm -hmm. someone who sells raw materials or intermediate goods to a firm. They'll bring these lawsuits accusing the firm they're, um, they're selling to for antitrust. Um, usually it's just over a breach of contract that they don't honor the terms of some contract. But if you sue under Clayton, the charges are tripled. So instead of just going after them and being made whole for however they breached the contract, they can get triple that if they go, if they sue under Clayton. So we see a lot of firms being willing to do that again, because they get more money for it. And it's also often brought by competitors. So according to Thomas Sowell, most cases um, are when monopolists actually charge lower prices instead of higher prices. So like A&P grocery stores um, at one point had a one fifth of the grocery sales in the country. So only 20%. But they were charged, they were the largest grocery store chain in the country and they were charged under Sherman for being a monopolist, despite the fact that they had lower prices. Um, all right, and I'll skip talking about Microsoft and getting into the details of that. Um, but Microsoft was charged under Sherman basically for um, for offering Internet Explorer for free when you had to like go and buy other companies, um, other web browsers. Again, they were accused of being a monopoly, but they're offering something for free. They're not even charging consumers for it. Well, in fact, it's hard to argue that consumers are being made worse off or that much worse off when they're being offered something for free. And it's very ironic now that they were brought that for um, Internet Explorer, but no one uses Internet Explorer anymore. Right. We'll end with regulating natural monopolies. So natural monopolies are can be a good thing. They can serve consumers more cheaply than multiple firms. 
when these natural monopolies exist. But unfortunately, the usual market forces that drive prices down for firms, because they're facing competition from other firms, they have to offer um, low prices. They can't just charge super high prices because people go to other firms. You don't have that with a natural monopoly. So even though they can be more efficient, you don't have the, um, uh, the incentives to offer lower prices. So typically what we see is local or state regulatory commissions that set the prices for these natural monopolies instead of allowing firms to do it themselves because they're going to naturally um, price it artificially high, far above um, the marginal cost. So we end up with a problem where um, regulators have to choose what price these firms should sell at. So should it be a price that makes the monopoly zero profit, <clears throat> charge or marginal revenue with marginal cost, they end up with no economic profit in the long run? Should be a price that would maximize consumer welfare and total economic surplus? Um, these are questions that they're forced to, to choose. How do you actually price it? And it's different basically for every state or local regulatory commission. It's up to them how they want to price it. So it can be kind of inconsistent across regions. Across the areas. Yeah, that brings us to the end of Monopoly. You guys have any questions about Monopoly? Things we covered in this chapter so far? All right, if not, then we can just pull up the study guide and go over that. Um, the questions you guys have for that. I didn't get it posted until yesterday, so I understand if you guys didn't get a chance to go through this. Um, I jotted down, I circled some of the questions this morning that I thought you guys would be the most likely to have questions about. So I can just hit them if you guys. Could you go over the first one after 22? Yeah, okay. I'll draw a firm, perfect competition. <clears throat> Remember you have the market and perfect competition, or we have the downward sloping demand curve and the upward sloping supply curve like normal. It's the only market in here, of course. Okay. And right next to that, we draw another one for the supply and demand curve for the industry, or for the um, firm within the industry. So the price is going to be there, the equilibrium price in the market. That's your, that's your horizontal line. Remember, demand equals the marginal revenue. We have our marginal cost curve, which is like the Nike swoosh. And we're going to be producing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So where those two curves cross each other is the quantity that that firm is going to be producing at. And then somewhere there's going to be average total cost, depending on whether we're looking at the short run or the long run. So let's just say we're in the long run here. We have the average total cost, which equals the price. So there's zero economic profit right here. And remember that the average total cost curve um, is going to cross the marginal cost curve at its minimum. So the difference between the price and the average total cost is going to be your per unit profit. So right here it's zero. So zero times whatever quantity is going to be zero. So we end up with a zero economic profit. If it was up here, they'd be, earn, they'd be earning a loss. If it was down here, they'd be earning a profit.
I was going to talk about shifting the market supply and demand curves, but um, there's no questions on the exam about shifting the market stuff. Only working with, I mean, you still need this to show like where the equilibrium price is going to be, but only questions you would get is like show this operating at a loss, show it operating at a profit. What happens in the long run? Well, I guess, okay, yeah, I'll show you. So right here, we have the average total cost curve below the price. So we have the firm op operating at a profit. The profit is going to be where average total cost curve equals that quantity that's being produced at. So this whole area right there. Price minus C times the quantity is going to be your profit. If this exists in the short run, because there's this profit, we're going to see more firms enter the market and they're going to begin competing. Because remember, there's no barriers to entry in this industry. So we will have the supply curve shift to the right. There. So yeah, you will have to work just with shifting supply when there's either profit or loss happening. So shifts till So the, till the market price, this new market price is now lower. It's down here, it's going to be the same as the average total cost. There. So if there's a profit, the supply curve shifts to the right. If there's a loss, it shifts to the left. That's right. It shifts to the to the right here because more firms are entering the market. And as more firms enter, they're going to naturally increase supply. And if there's a loss. Some firms are going to exit the market because now you know they're earning economic loss. They can make more money um, providing goods and services in another industry. Remember, this is economic profit, so this takes into account opportunity cost as well. So not just the physical outlays you have, like the money you are paying to create the goods or services, to actually like manufacture them. It also includes the opportunity cost of being able to make money in other industries. And then if it was a loss, would it be profit plus ATC times one? It would still be uh, price minus average total cost. Okay. So you end up with, I don't know, let's say the price is $6 and the average total cost is $6.50. So you end up with that per unit profit, which is really a loss of 50 cents. Why is perfect competition not a good model for the real world? So basically, how does the model fall short of what we actually see happening? So in pretty much every market, you see differentiation of the products. So each firm is able to somehow make their goods different from other firms. Um, sometimes it's due to quality. They'll make like a higher quality. Sometimes it'll be lower quality good, but they offer it at a much lower price. Um, uh, sometimes they're known for reliability and lasting a long time. Um, there's a ton of different ways that they're able to do that, to make their products somehow different. There's usually some sorts of barriers to entry, so you don't have firms immediately beginning to compete. Um, it takes some time to enter industries, which is another assumption of perfect competition, is that there's no barriers to entry whatsoever. Um, Uh, 
Oh, yeah, and there was the third assumption. There, there's um, a ton of firms, a ton of producers, and a ton of buyers. There's often not that many companies that like offer a product. And there's other problems like because it assumes away um, differentiation of products, you lose the entire idea of competition. A firm's offering new products, trying to create new products. There's no reason to do research and development, trying to develop something new in a perfectly competitive market. just went over it, but the monopolist maximizing profit, remember for that one, we end up with your demand curve there and your marginal revenue curve there. Your marginal cost curve, again, the same shape as in a perfectly competitive market. They decide to produce where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. No, that's, not done. that's going to be the same for both perfect competition and for monopoly. So remember that. But instead of pricing it there, they're going to price it up here on the demand curve at that quantity. So that's the price actually being sold instead of down here. If you can't remember that for the test, or if you're like blanking on it, just remember that monopolies charge much higher than is efficient. And again, this highlights the problem with monopoly. We end up with much higher prices than you see in industries with much more competition. Remember for um, the law of diminishing returns, that as a firm adds more variable inputs to, um, to fixed capital, you end up with less and less production coming from as you add more and more workers. So this is your output, and this is your quantity of workers. You end up with increasing sharply at first, and then over time, it flattens out. Because as you add more and more workers, remember there's only so many pizza ovens in the pizza shop, as you keep adding more and more workers to it, eventually you're not going to be able to do much else. There's only so many pizzas you can put in there. Would that be a graph for a marginal product of labor industry? Uh, yes. And how to overcome it? Add more capital. Or the pizza shop that we talked about, for example, they have two pizza ovens the whole time as they have more and more workers. Output increases by less each time. You add another pizza oven, you now produce a bunch more pizzas. So that's how to break out of the law of diminishing returns. All right, it's 9.50. So if you guys have any other questions, uh, it's working.